2023, we are having the time of our lives during this Feast of Tabernacles. You, If you don't have worship vision on your internet, you need to get it because we're having such an intense experience in here in the worship, it would blow your mind if you were here in person. So today, since I got favorable comments on the Hebrew prayers, we're going to pick it up with the uh, Hebrew prayer, the Avot, which we do before we give the word. So if you're ready, Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu V'Elohe Avoteinu V'Emoteinu Elohe Avraham Elohe Yitzchak V'Elohe Yaakov Elohe Sarah Elohe Rivka Elohe Raquel V'Elohe Leah Ha'el Hagedol Hagibor Vahanora El El Yon Gomel Kasadim Tovim Vikone hakol vizoker kasade avot v'imahot umeavi geula leve v'nehem lamaan shamo baahava melech ozir umashia umagain barukata adonai magain avraham v'ezrat sarat. Y'all can be seated. So we use a particular form of the avot that includes the, 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 the matriarchs, the mothers, as well as the patriarchs, the fathers. Because how many of you all know that behind every good man is a woman that keeps him in line? So if it wasn't for Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, we wouldn't have the whole nation of Israel, so we include them all. And we do the evoke before the message because it protects the seed of the word. And we want to protect the seed of the word from the uh, demonic angel uh, birds that want to take it away. Now today we're going to talk about the tending the morning star rising in your hearts. And we put together this great book, uh, Rise and Shine Like the Stars, to do a deep, thorough, in-depth biblical study on the morning star rising in your hearts. This is not available through Salem Press at bookstores around the country. You must mail us at Post Office Box 10334, Jackson, Tennessee, 38308. I think it's $14 for this. That includes shipping, sales tax, the whole thing. 14 bucks out the door, and we'll get this in the mail to you right away. I spent five years working on this book, and I think you will enjoy it. And we're going to take it from where this book leaves off today. Tending the morning star rising. Now we've talked about this for a long time. We're going to pick up a verse in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19. Where Peter talks about the morning star rising. I think it's the first mention of this, of this term in the Bible. It's amazing how much the Bible talks about the fire of the Holy Spirit in many, many places. And in all over the Bible. But right here, I think, is the first mention of the term morning star rising. It's in 2 Peter 1 and verse 19. And he says this, And we have the word of the prophets made more certain, and we will do well to pay attention to it as the light shining in a dark place. So he's telling you that the words of the prophets, remember, he doesn't have a New Testament. He doesn't have a New Testament. It's the word of the Old Testament prophets has been made more certain in Peter's time. And we would pay do well to pay attention to it as a light in a dark place. Now, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to walk in the dark. It's a little easier when you're young. The older you get, you've got to have a nightlight. Some of y'all get that. Um, but you need a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns. Now, what does it mean by the day dawn? The day dawning is the day of the return of Yeshua to rescue the saints. Now, I know there's a lot of people right now that are teaching against the rescue of the saints, but you've got to cut whole passages out of your Bible, in some cases whole chapters. And I'm not willing to cut anything out of my Bible. But they'll say, well, Pastor Bill, there's a, there's a great tribulation. Yeah, there is. So avoid it, right? I mean, they had, they had a TV commercial not long ago with this famous fisherman, and there's a, there's a guy who trips over his tackle box and dumps all the stuff tackle and all the hooks all over the the deck there you know and, and, and the, the famous fisherman goes don't do that <laughs> okay so don't do that 
there's people right now bragging that it's a it's an honor to go into great tribulation no it's not you come up later and you don't get any honors when you come up don't do that go in the rescue all the honors are for the people who are willing to live it now in the good times and a part of that is tending to the morning star rising how do i say that because it's the next thing he says until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts the morning star rising in your heart is a sign of your eminent rescue. We need to learn how to tend the morning star rising right now. I mean, after all, when you look out there, is it more certain to you than in Peter's time? If it was pretty certain to Peter and it's got 2,000 years before we get to us, what do you think it is right now? So the word of the prophets is a light to keep you sane in the insane world right because you look around in the news and you're like what 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 what's going on i mean this is crazy what what but you go to the prophets and the prophet says this and this and this and this is going to happen in the end times in israel and you look out there and it's happening right now in the end times in israel so that keeps you sane it's not you going crazy they're under the curse of the law so that word it's also demonstrating to you the will of God that the morning star should be rising in your heart. The more you look at prophecy, the more you see the whole world coming undone, that, world is that word is demonstrating to you the morning star should be coming up in you. And we've talked about the inputs many times. They're in the book if you buy it. Bible study. And I always come back to Bible study, right? Because it's the number one thing missing in most people's lives. Oh, you're always picking on me. Well, I'm not picking on you. I'm trying, I'm trying to get you up to a place where you got enough word to go. Right? So if you let, if you let your car run out of gasoline, is it going to go? Am I picking on you to tell you the yellow light's on? You better go down to the gas station. See, no one thinks of it that way. But we all got the yellow lights flashing for Bible study. It's like, hey, man, you need to get in some word and fill up. Oh, you're always harping on me about Bible study. Well, the word harps on you about Bible study. Jesus harps on you about Bible study. My job is to try to help you to get to where you need to go, right? And prayer. A lot of people neglect prayer. Now, we have a thing here at Hungry Hearts called Advanced Prayer where some of us have taken classes and learned how to pray in a better way. And a lot of folks took umbrage to that. Were you saying we can't pray? It's amazing to me how every time you want to improve and do something better, everybody who doesn't want to improve now takes it as an affront that you don't want to sit there in third grade. You want to move on up into junior high school. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, you know, we take it as a matter of course in the world that you have to improve all the time. But for some reason in church, oh, improvement is banned. Improvement is wrong. Oh, you don't, don't improve yourself in the Holy Ghost. Well... That's what we're supposed to do, right? Improve ourselves. I mean, how many times does Jesus say it? Worship. We should worship. That's a vital part of it. And trials. Okay. I, I just want to take a, rab, a quick rabbi trail. What's the difference between a trial and a hard time? A trial is when you have to suffer over following God, obeying his word. A hard time is when someone does something to you as totally unrelated to God's word, right? You're in the parking lot, someone backs in your car. If you're just buying groceries, that's a hard time. If you have a situation where you are, are forced into pain over obeying God and you disobey, you just had a hard time. It's only a trial if you take the character from obeying under duress. If you disobey to avoid the pain, it's a hard time. So you can take, you can take something God sends you for your development and growth, and, and you can turn it into just you had a hard time. We're tried all the time. If you think being a Christian and you're not going to be tried over the points in the book are the points you get in prayer. You got another thing coming. Because you're going to be tried over at all time. And we, we give the devil too much credit. Oh, the devil, the devil's busting my chops. Sometimes, sometimes it's Jesus putting you in a situation where you got to make a decision. 
you got to make a decision. There's pain involved. So a lot of times someone will come in and, and, and they'll get all excited over some point in the Bible and you already know what's going to happen to them. You're going to go home, your spouse is going to go crazy, your kids are going to go crazy, your job is going to go crazy, and you're like, oh, if only they could just be in that obedience for enough time to get strong before the trial. But Yeshua was like, oh, no, 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 no. As soon as you take the joy, he wants to know right now if you're going to follow through. He puts the trial immediately, doesn't he? And a lot of times people don't make it. I mean, I've been in ministry a long time. I've seen a lot of people get real excited over some point of truth, and within minutes or hours, it is shut down. We think, oh, how bad that was. No, they, what did Jesus say? The one on the rocky ground is when you sow the seed and they receive it with great joy, but they got no root, and when persecution comes because of the word, they burn up. They didn't have any root. Yeah, they were all excited, but they didn't, put, they didn't have any commitment level. So when you receive the words, you've got to have a commitment level. See, everything I'm going to teach you for the rest of the, this message involves you having a commitment level to the Word of God. So I've been, I've been doing ministry for 20 years. I've seen so many people come and go. What, the bottom line core is they didn't have enough word for the trial they were in, and they didn't have the commitment level to see to it. Those are the two things that take people out. So I always go back to those two things, right? This is where we got to be strong. All right, worship mostly takes place in church. We, we'd worship some at home, but most of it takes place in church. The others take place at home. So the question is, do we tend to the morning star rising at home? Or do, you know, do we think about it when we're home? Because usually we get to church and we go back to whatever activities we got to do, our, our earthly, worldly activities, and we just forget about it until Friday. Oh, yeah, wow, yeah, I was supposed to do this for church. You know, we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan for every day we're going to tear off a little piece of it. They call that, in time management, they call that the salami principle. You don't eat a salami. You know, we, we see salamis that's already sliced in a little package, but a salami is a great big old giant sausage. You don't sit down and just eat a salami. They slice it. You eat a couple slices at a time. And so one of the, the more easy to use and, and uh, effective time management tools is to take it a slice at a time. You sit down with a project and you break it down into pieces and then you set a goal. Well, on this day, because every day is different, right? Some days are more busy than those. On this day, I've got a chunk of time that I can get this piece done and you make it a hard, fast rule. And when you set your time up like that, you're going to have to fight for it, right? But if you'll fight for it enough times, you'll beat the devil down over time, and then you'll be able to set that up and make it work for you. And when you can do a little piece here and a little piece there, a little bit every day, you'll find that by and large, when you start coming into Shabbos on Friday night, you are prepared. You are ready. You didn't wait until the last minute. Now you got to cram. You were able to do a little bit here and do a little bit there. Next thing you know, it just all wrapped up, and you're, you will be more relaxed you will be less stressed, and you will be far more effective, and you'll be able to have time to tend the morning star rising at home. And, and with that Bible study, that prayer, you'll be able to recognize the trials, and you'll be able to pray in the Spirit during those trials and actually do something with them instead of just panicking when the crisis hits. Amen? Now, the Holy Spirit has an associated fire. Do we tend to it? Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2. The Holy Spirit has a fire associated with it. Do we tend to it? Now, I know this is a passage that seems to be unrelated. 1 Peter 2 and verse 4. As you come to Yeshua, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to God, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. All right, so a lot of people want to say, oh, yes, we're the royal priesthood, and do nothing. This doesn't say do nothing. This is to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. Now, when you go back to the, 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 the offerings, 
And the sacrifices, every single one of them says an offering made to the Lord by fire. An offering made to the Lord by fire. You do a little word studies, like three words together, and it really means an offering made to the Lord by fire. So I had a Pentecostal lady ask me that. Oh, I'm in the words, impress me, make an offering to the Lord by fire. And I wasn't this developed in the morning star to be able to give her a legitimate answer. I just had to say, I don't know. But we've developed this for eight years now, and we have a much better understanding about making an offering by fire. You see, I, the Lord, I'm almost done. I think I gave it to you as an unproofed handout, and I finally found a proofer, so we're going to get it proofed and made it into a real book. But the point is that priests are active. Priesthood doesn't mean you do nothing. Priesthood doesn't mean that you have a secular job and that's all you do between Sabbaths. A priest means you have duties to do. There's work to perform. Now, some of the priests <clears throat> were scattered through the territory and they had a course. So you read about David set the priest up in courses. John the Baptist's father was a priest in the course of Abijah. That's how you can date his birth. Abijah served at a certain time. Therefore, that meant that when John the Baptist's daddy went in and the angel said, your wife's about to be pregnant, you can date the pregnancy, and nine months later, you have the approximate birth date. And you can date the birth of Jesus that way, because when Mary was with child by the Holy Spirit, she went to her cousin, John the Baptist's mother, and it says she was six months pregnant. That's how you can date the birth of Jesus, the birth of John the Baptist, the courses. So if you were in the countryside, you served teaching your villagers Torah, and you went once a year to Jerusalem to, to serve as a priest in the temple in addition to going up for holy days and whatever. All right, some of them didn't have any, any uh, village duty, they devoted themselves totally to priest service. They worked there year round, but they only got to go in the temple building when it was their course. So if you're the course of Abijah and you live in Jerusalem and you report to the temple every day, you help out with all the duties that's got to be done, the temple treasuries, the keeping the clothes together, overseeing the Levites with the wood and the fire and you know the animals and and taking people's offering from them at the gate, but only the ones whose course it was could go in the, in the house to eat the showbread, tend the menorah, and offer the incense. You follow what I'm saying? There's work to do. So when you say, I'm a part of the royal priesthood, that means you, you're, you got duties. One of your duties is tending the fire. See, we take it as a metaphor. Well, I'm part of the royal priesthood. And then nothing. Well, what happens to people who have a duty and they don't do it? Jesus said, you're an unprofitable servant. I'm kicking you out. Huh. Well, now verse 9 says, You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him. So one of the duties of a priest is to declare the praises. So when we changed services up to declare the praises, some took it, some, some got angry. Now, I'm, I'm still, I'm still kind of, what? How do you get angry over declaring the praises when that's your stated job? Your stated job is declare the praises. Now, evidently, there's a lot of people in the church of God who do not want to be a part of this priesthood. Nonetheless, Peter's not thinking metaphorically. Remember, when Peter's writing this, they're still killing animals at the temple. He's not looking at a metaphorical feel-good verse. He's looking at men who were killing animals and tending the menorah and offering incense. All of this stuff is going on. It's a functioning thing on, on the temple. I, I'm going to say temple mount because the temple was on a mount. There's just some speculation as to whether it's on the one they call that now where the mosque is or if it was down in the city of David. But all three of those are mounts. Mount Zion was below and then where the temple, I think it was in the city of David. And then further up the hill is where the, the, uh, the mosque is now. But all three of those are called mounts. And they're surrounded by deep valleys. Of course, one's been filled in. But 
So many of the Levitical priesthood came our way. I'm not going to go to the verse, but in Acts it says a lot of them, a lot of them received Yeshua. So they didn't so much die out as they mostly converted to Christ. The priests used the temple furniture. They used the pieces. They actually killed animals at the altar of sacrifice and had to sprinkle the blood. And hey, you better do it properly, right? Just ask Nate to have an you about what happens when you don't follow the protocol. So they had to take the animals. They had to inspect the animals. Uh, they had to cut and gut the animals. They had to skin the animals. They had a lot of work to do. It wasn't just, oh, nothing. I'm a, I'm a royal priest. I just go to church on Saturday. And you'd be surprised how many people think that's all they got to do to be a part of the royal priesthood. And, you know, I was among them once upon a time. But after you really start studying all this, it's like, man, we got to kick our game up. I mean, we're saying stuff and making ourselves responsible, but we're not doing the job. So they washed at the labor. They ate the bread from the table. They tended the menorah. They offered incense at the altar. And the high priest sprinkled blood at the ark. Their use and care of those pieces gives us a lot of clues about our duties as the royal priesthood. Leviticus chapter 6 gives us a lot of clues as to our duties. Leviticus 6 and verse 8. The Lord said to Moses, Give Aaron and his sons this commandment. These are the regulations for the burnt offering. The burnt offering is to remain on the altar hearth throughout the night till morning, and the fire must be kept burning on the altar. That means somebody has got to stay up all night, stir that stuff up, and keep putting fresh wood on there. Somebody's got to stay up. Now, I think, I think uh, we've learned from several Messianic people that have done this research that there were three watches in a, in a Hebrew night. So I'm sure they, no one had to just, tonight's my night, I'm up all night. I mean, you had an early, early shift, a middle shift, and the early morning shift, right? So you had three shifts of guys are going to show up to that altar, and their goal is to take the tools and stir the stuff up to keep it going and to keep putting fresh wood to make sure it doesn't go out. Somebody's got to do that. Fire does not burn by itself without being tended. And then you got guys coming on in the daytime. So I don't know if the daytime had the same system, but however the deal was, somebody's got to show up in the morning and do the same thing. Because the burnt offering was one in the morning and one in the evening, right? So he says, the priest shall then put on his linen clothes, you know, the, the, the simple white ones like we wore on atonement, and with linen on their garments, they shall his body, and he shall remove the ashes of the burnt offering that the fire has consumed on the altar and place them aside. So somebody's got to come on in the morning shift, and they got to take all the good embers off to the side, not let them go out, and clean all the ashes off. Because they're, they're most holy now. Then he said, take off these clothes and put on street clothes and carry the ashes outside the camp to a place that is clean. So several of the, the Roku studies we've looked at, there was like a little bridge across the one valley. And they, they walked across this little bridge and they had a place over there to keep the ashes. And it's also where they kept the water of purification. Outside the camp, across the valley, but in a clean place. So they had a designated place for that with guards there. Because they didn't want you getting in the ashes. And they didn't want you getting in the water. But they didn't keep it on the temple mount. So they had a designated place for that. All right. The fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning the priest is to add new firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire and burn the fat of the fellowship offerings on it. The fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. So we're not supposed to let the morning star rise and go out. Once we get lit, we're supposed to keep it going. So every morning, we've got to clear off the ashes and arrange fresh wood on the altar. In our lives, this means we have to clear out yesterday's ashes and get our heads back in that word afresh every day. We have to put some Holy Spirit on that word every morning. Amen? Leviticus 16, verse 12. <clears throat> Got to put some Holy Spirit on that word. <clears throat> now, we're talking about incense here. We're breaking into the Day of Atonement. He is to, verse 12, he's to take the censer, a censer full of burning coals from the altar of sacrifice. 
You see, all the fire for every piece comes out of that altar. That altar where we repent, that altar where we get right with the Lord is the fire from which we use to light the menorah and offer incense and prayer. It always goes back to the fire from that, right? So the menorah was always to be kept burning. Exodus 30. Matter of fact, in the Jewish temple right now, they've got, they've got a light, a little lantern, and it's supposed to be the eternal flame in there. And it is hardwired to a circuit breaker, and that circuit breaker is marked never turn off. And they were freaking out when they had to cut the electricity off to the building because the wiring was from 1940, and they had to, they had to go back and redo all that. But they had to turn it off, and they were all tripping out because they didn't want the light to go out ever. But it's like, hey, you got to renovate the building, you know. <clears throat> Exodus 30 and verse 7. Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the menorah. Every time they tended the menorah, they had to offer incense. Now, I'm not going to take the rabbi trail to Revelation where it says that on the incense altar in heaven above, that's where your prayers are offered. But there's like two passages that say that. On the altar of incense in front of Avi's throne, your prayers are offered. So Jewish legend has it that the prayers of all righteous people came to the temple and went up from that altar of incense that stood in the temple of Solomon. So he must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight so incense will burn regularly before the Lord. Ha Olam. Forever. Never stops. Do not offer on this altar any other incense or any burnt offering or grain offering. Do not pour a drink offering on it. Once a year Aaron shall make atonement on its horns. The annual atonement must be made with the blood of the atoning sin offered for the generated most holy to the Lord. So when he took the, the goat's blood in and the bull's blood in for himself on atonement, he also had to put some on the horns of the incense altar to make atonement for all our mispraying. I didn't say missed praying. I said mispraying. Pray for stuff we're not supposed to pray for. Is to make atonement for that. So the morning star rising is a source of holy fire to be used in our every priestly duty. So when you sit down and you think about what am I supposed to do as a priest? I'm supposed to pray. I'm supposed to pray in tongues. I'm supposed to get in the word. You got to have some fire for that, right? You got some fire. Now the altar of sacrifice out in the courtyard is where the repentance was supposed to take place. Let's go to Hosea 8. I don't think they quite understood that back in ancient times. Hosea 8. Sacrifice was not the payment so they could keep on sinning. It was supposed to be repentance. You see what it cost and you decided not to, to do it anymore. Hosea 8 and verse 11. Though Ephraim built many altars for sin offerings, these have become, become altars for sinning. So in other words, instead of coming there and saying, wow, that was expensive, I got, I got to stop that. They decided, oh, got plenty of lambs. Yeah, here's a lamb. I'll keep right on. Whatever my favorite sin is, as long as I gave a lamb, it's all good, right? So instead of an altar to repent, it became an altar to tote to note, so I just keep right on going. I got, you take, I'll never forget the one uh, Bible movie we saw, and King Herod was there, and the priests bring in this big bull, and they're going to slaughter this bull for the sins of Herod. You can see the Herod character has no interest in this whatsoever. It's all pro forma. You know, I'm king of these idiots, so I'm just doing whatever they got makes them happy. And so it's like you're just killing the, you're just killing the cow. Because he's not about to stop what he's doing. It's just killing the cow. Make, it makes them happy. There's no revolt. And I'm going on back to my crazy life. Repentance is the key to everything we desire in the Spirit of God. Repentance opens, our, repentance opens our sight. Opens the gifts. Open revelation. And it opens our spirit to the presence of God. Now, There's lots of things that can distract that. But some of the time it's lack of repentance. It come in, someone has a great experience, and you're like, I didn't feel that today. I'm not saying every time it's that lack of repentance, but I can tell you right now, sometimes it is. Sometimes, even for me, especially when I got to come from Corinth to Jackson and I drive in traffic, and I'm not real repentant yet for being. Look, 
I didn't even say anything the time the guy almost ran me to a telephone pole. Did I tell you about that when I came up here? The time I, I was down in Bemis and this guy wanted my lane and it was next to a pole and I, I barely avoided being run into a pole. I didn't say anything ugly, but I sure wasn't thinking anything nice. And thus sometimes I don't feel a move when I come to Jackson because I'm not repentant yet for being angry at people who were doing crazy stuff in traffic. So you get here at 1 o'clock, you got time to calm down. You know. But when you come here at 2.30 and the music's already on, and you got 20 minutes to, to get up here to film, sometimes you ain't right yet, right? So sometimes it is. Sometimes it is. Repentance, keeping clean with Yeshua. By the way, most of you have told me in here that you've seen things in the Spirit. So I know you have enough repentance to be able to see and experience things. So we're not really talking necessarily. I'm just giving you academic. Now Jude, Jude in verse 20 is that little tiny letter tucked right before the beginning of Revelation. Jude 20. He says, but you, dear friends, build yourself up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. So praying in the Spirit is important. It makes you strong. It builds you up. It's fuel for the morning star rising. When you're praying in tongues, you're putting, you're putting some air and some fuel on that fire. Now I'm going to show you something really important. Go back to James. James chapter 1. I alluded to it yesterday. We'll talk about it today. The Word. We always come back to the Word, right? The Word. You can never talk enough about the Word and the Bible and getting in there. And being excited about getting in there. James 1 and verse 18. He chose to give you birth through the word of truth. To, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So he made cows after the cattle kind. He made kitties after the kitty kind. He made puppy dogs after the puppy dog kind. But he made you after the God kind. And he chose to give you that birth through the Word. So that this Bible, this Word, is the Father's DNA that comes in you to transform your spirit. DNA is a metaphorical reference, right? So the Word comes into your spirit and that's what's transforming you into a first fruits of His kind of creatures. That's why you can't neglect Bible every day. That means we have to clear off yesterday's ashes and put some fresh wood on the fire. We have to get into the Word daily to tend the morning star rising. If you don't get into Word then you're not tending that fire. 1 Corinthians 14. In verse 10. I'm sorry, verse 2. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. Okay. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. So when you're praying in tongues, this is not about you standing at the altar making a request this is about your spirit inside, your new creature praying to God. Right? Because sometimes we get in the way of our own praying. But we need this influx of Holy Spirit power. Amen? Verse 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. That's the same as we just read in Jude. You're building up your faith and you're building up your spirit, man, by praying in a tongue. But he who prophesies edifies the church. And that's not, that's not preaching up here like a lot of people want to say. That's when a prophet stands up and gives a word of prophecy. Verse 5, I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. So everybody takes this verse and says, he don't want to speak in tongues. But Paul says, I want every one of you to speak in tongues. And it builds you up. It builds you up. So they take these verses right here and misconstrue them to say, no speaking in tongues in church. Speaking in tongues in church is how you open up the gifts. It's how you get the thing moving. It's also how you cultivate and tend to the morning star rising. 
you got to put some tongues on that word. So I'm not saying it's all word and no tongues. I'm not saying it's all tongues and no word. You got to you got to put some fresh fire on there, and then you got to put some air on that fire. So you got to have word, and then you got to pray in tongues. It's important. Verse 18. I thank God I speak in tongues more than all of you. So, so much for Paul saying no tongue talking. Many of these passages banish the use of praying in the Spirit. I'm trying to convey to you the power you can derive from in the Holy Spirit by praying in tongues. You can derive usable power. You get a block, you get a mental block on, on, on a subject you're studying or a message you're preparing or a prayer we're supposed to pray. Put some word on it and pray in tongues. What if it don't come right away? Hit it again. You got to have some perseverance in this, right? Yeah, I studied and I prayed in tongues. I studied and I prayed in tongues. I studied and I prayed in tongues. I know it's like a broken record, but you, you hammer it until it breaks. And then when it breaks, you're going to get not only this amazing revelation release, you're going to get the anointing to go with it. Amen? Oh, you're going to get the anointing to go with it. And then, if, it's your, if you're on duty for the day, instead of worshiping and pouring out your soul to God, you're just trying to go back to that place in the Holy Spirit where the anointing was released so that you carry that same anointing you got in your prayer place up here to deliver the message. Yeah, that's how that works. John chapter 4. John chapter four. So, so, so some of y'all, some of y'all get it because sometimes you know I'm, I'm trying to make a I mean, the hands do what they want sometimes, right? That's why I pray in tongue. I mean, type in tongue sometimes. I mean, I'm going a s a s d f semicolon, but it's not doing all that right. It's doing whatever it wants. John four and verse ten. If you knew the gift of God and who it was asked you for a drink, you'd ask him to give you living water. That word is Doria. That word gift is Doria. It always refers to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, if you knew the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I can give you, you would have asked me for a drink, and I would have opened up a well in you that would blow your mind. Verse 13, he says it again. Everyone who drinks this water out of that well, Jacob's well, will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So praying in the Spirit opens the well of God's Spirit to flow into our lives. Now, if you go to, I'm not going to go there. I'm just going to give you the reference, Acts 1 and verse 4. He talks about this gift again, and this is how I know this gift refers to the Holy Spirit. So the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is the living water that's become, going to become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And praying in the Spirit or praying in tongues is how to open up that well and get the Spirit moving and flowing in your life. The Hebrew prayers are how to trim the wicks. It's how to do the tending of the menorah. Trimming the wicks keeps the fire fresh. You can use these Hebrew prayers to tend the Spirit's fire within your human spirit. The prayers are also how to offer things up. Because remember, we're a royal priesthood, right? So the first thing when I, I started exploring this so many years back now, and I'm like, what do we do? They, they don't have a priest manual, if Moses wrote it, it didn't make the scroll. Right? You got Leviticus and it tells you to make the offering, but he doesn't tell you what you're supposed to do when you make the offering. It doesn't say what you say when you put the, the, the animal on there. It doesn't say what you say when you pour its blood out. <clears throat> Was there some form of the Venislock <clears throat> way back then? Who knows? Then write that down. Do you trust the oral re the oral record after all those years? Probably not. Everybody changes those things how they want to. Where's the written record for how the animals to be cut? And I mean, it tells you a little bit in Leviticus, but it doesn't tell you a lot of it. I guarantee, if you took an animal and started cutting him up, it wouldn't make any sense to you. What's to be said when you put that animal on the altar in the fire? What's to be said? What's to be said when you put the incense on the altar of sacrifice? What's to be said when you trim the wicks and oil the menorah and relight the ones? Because you, you can't trim the wicks while it's burning. 
One by one, the lamp's got to go out. What do you say when you relight them? See, these things aren't in the Bible. But they are. The Bible's a big book, got a lot of words in it. You can look them up. It takes you a while to figure out where you might find them. Praise God, we have a concordance. Helps a lot. <clears throat> but the point to it is, stuff has to be said. We're just going to use our, our English? Well, howdy there, Lord. Good to see you this morning. Is that how we're going to do it? Probably not, right? You think that's maybe how Aaron did it? I doubt it. So we pray in English a lot. And we tend to repeat the same phrases in our prayers, whether we do them orally or we do just how we are. We're human beings. We repeat the same phrases. So let me ask you, are your personal phrases as eloquent as the ones in the Hebrew prayers? Not usually. Not usually. Not usually. So these prayers are established. I was watching Jonathan Kahn last week, and he was talking about prophetic events that took place, except he did it in the context of what was in the Parsha on that day. So on this particular day, this happens, and this is what they're reciting in the, in the Jewish synagogues while it's taking place outside. And you know, it matched up perfectly. It matched up perfectly. What they said in temple was exactly what was going on outside in the street in every one of those cases. So if it's that good, why isn't it good enough for us to use, right? Well, it is, obviously. I'm <clears throat> speaking to the choir. So these are the Hebrew prayers are how to properly offer up our own prayers. Now think about the hamotzi. Isn't it a great way to offer up your thankfulness for the food? Or the Venislach, right, when we're going to take communion. You know, forgive the sons of Israel all their sins, whatever they may be. Isn't that a real good way to do it? Or the Shema. Isn't that a good way to ask God that you want to be one with him in spirit? Or the Barku. Isn't the Barku, praising the name of God, the way to initiate things? Or maybe the Viahafta. Could our repeating that we're supposed to obey him right out of Deuteronomy, reading the passage in Deuteronomy, we're, we'll obey you this time? When he's, Could that not be a part of the repentance that we need to keep real with Yeshua? Luke chapter 12, just a few pages back, and verse 49. He said, I've come to bring fire on the earth and how I wished it were already kindled. Yeshua came to bring spirit fire on the earth and he wished it was already kindled in his followers in that day. He already wished it was kindled. But he knew it wasn't going to kindle until after he was ascended. But he already wanted it going. This is something he wants. What we have to do is participate with him. He wants the fire in you. We have to be willing participants in the fire in us. Bible study, prayer, worship, and trials. Trials, obeying under duress. Thank you, Jesus. It's now and not in a great tribulation. Amen? Everybody's going to do this. It's just some are going to wait until they're forced. And some of us are going to be volunteers. Now, this ought to be a real easy sell in Tennessee. We're supposed to volunteer to do this now. 1 Peter chapter 1. Those of you in TV land, we have a super superlative off, uh, altar service lined up and unfortunately you won't be able to be here for that but we're going to have one time in the Holy Ghost when we close out 1 Peter 1 and verse 6 <clears throat> in this we greatly rejoice it's our trials we rejoice that's hard to do take, take some skill because usually when the crisis hits we're not rejoicing we're freaking out Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Rejoice in these. That, that takes skill. These come so that your faith of greater worth than gold. Hey, look, I like gold. Gold's good stuff. Which perishes even though refined by the fire. 
right? Gold can be burned up if the fire's hot enough. And he's saying that your faith refined in those trials is not ever going to burn up. Your faith refined in those trials is never going to burn up. And you going through that trial is going to prove you genuine, which is going to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ comes back to rescue you. Your faith is going to be proved genuine. That word genuine is a Greek mining term, which means we've put the gold in the fire until it's nothing but gold left. Right, Because when you put the, the ore in there, a lot of stuff burns off. The slag rises to the top, and you got the ancients didn't know how to do a lot of stuff, so they just kept burning the gold until there was only gold left. That's what that word genuine means. You've been burned in the fire till there's only godly character left. And that's going to result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ comes to get you. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And yet a lot of us have seen him in the Spirit. Right? So Peter's writing to new believers that have not had this experience yet. And I'm talking to believers, many of whom have seen him in the Spirit. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Man, when we get a chance to see the Lord in the Spirit, we should be filled with an even more inexpressible, glorious joy than people who were just believing because they were told. Amen? So I've referred to that pain in a trial as a pearl of great price. And in another message on a Pentecost long ago, we talked about that pain being a door to allow you to open up into the morning star rising. The pain you suffered for obeying God, that is a key. You know, pearls are made around a grain of sand, right? There's got to be something in the oyster to irritate it to make it form a pearl. Every one of us needs that, that little point of pain from obedience under duress to form the pearl of great price in our spirit. But that's also a great place to go if you're having trouble tapping the morning star. You think about that place you had to obey in great distress because that's where the fire is. 1 Samuel chapter 1. We're going to look at Hannah. We looked at Hannah several times in, in this series on 1 Samuel chapter 1. We've talked about Hannah a lot of times. Hannah, Hannah's a, a, a great lady of God. You know, I don't know if she had the Holy Spirit or, she, Spirit or she didn't have the Holy Spirit. She lived in a time when it was rare, amen? So maybe she had it, maybe she didn't have it. I don't want to say she didn't. Because she demonstrates a lot of really good character here. Or maybe her example is just one that the Lord really wants us to look at. 1 Samuel 1 and verse 9. <clears throat> Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Hannah had a, was married to a man with two wives. And the other wife had a lot of children and used to taunt her because she didn't have any children. So a rival wife, she's in a really bad circumstance. She is anguished deep in her soul. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. This is the tabernacle at Shiloh. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord, and she made a vow. She made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I'm going to give him to you for all the days of his life. Now, what follows, no razor on his head, means she's going to give him as a Nazarite. She's going to give him as a Nazarite, devoted to the Lord. This guy can never do anything except serve the Lord his whole life. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. It's moving, but he doesn't hear any sound. <clears throat> Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard, and Eli thought she was drunk. Now, why would Eli think? Because his sons were getting all the women drunk and were taking them out behind the tent and doing stuff with them. That's why. Sin's running rampant. He's too old to get his boys in check and they're doing whatever they want to do and telling their dad to go buzz off. And so he's like, this is another one of them. Out of control. So what does that mean? And a little further in this chapter, you're going to find that the word of the Lord was rare in that time. See, the sin, the sin stopped God from wanting to talk to him anymore. The sin. That's why it's good to get the sin out of the house. Because when there's enough sin, God doesn't want to talk in there anymore. But when you get the sin out of the house, then you find the Lord's right back. 
It's like, oh, well, where were you? It's more like, where were you guys? You let it go on in the house, and I wasn't there. He So he said to her, how long you keep getting drunk? It's like, that's what I need, another woman coming up in here drunk, and my boys will have her out back. Get rid of your wine. Not so, my Lord had replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I have not been drinking. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. This is an easy formula right here, right? You go with anguish. You got that pearl, you get that pain, that, that pearl of great price. You get that pain and you pour out your soul. I've been praying out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may Yod Vavhe grant you what you've asked of him. So prayer, Bible study, prayer, worship trials, all this is working together in this woman's life. This is the Feast of Tabernacles, by the way. <laughs> this is the Feast of Tabernacles. They've come to the Feast of Tabernacles. She's not having joy. He's giving her double portions because he loves her more than the other wife, which begs the question, if you love her, why are you with her? Now, I understand Yaakov. Laban tricked him. He didn't know he, didn't know he had the wrong woman until he woke up. Got him drunk. The woman's all veiled. He can't really tell. Next thing he knows, I've been had. So really, Leah got had even worse because she was passed off and maybe she didn't even like Jacob. Oh, Jacob, you're after that old daughter, sister of mine. You know she ain't no good. Uh, but then Laban sends her in there, right? I mean, it's a whole messed up deal, right? They just had to make the best of it. This isn't that way. So what if she had the spirit? What if she'd had the spirit? So you got Bible study, prayer, worship, trials, all working together. What if she'd had the spirit? Boy, she'd have had some spark. There'd have been some morning star fire lit up in there. There'd have been something going on. You hear what I'm saying? The more Bible you know, the closer to his will that you're going to pray. At least I've been talking about that. I've been talking about it in advanced prayer with all of y'all. The more Bible you have on a particular topic, that's why when the Lord gives us that list, the first thing you got to do is pull a concordance out and look some verses up, right? You get, you know, advanced prayer requires work. Of course, I, I know y'all know that. Y'all are all singing to the choir here. But the more Bible you know, the more his will. That was the first lesson, right? Pray in his will. And so the more Bible you know on a topic, the more you're going to know his will. See, you had to put blood on the horns of the altar of incense for the times we're praying out of his will. No need for the times you're praying in his will. If you're praying in his will, of course he wants to do it, right? Did y'all notice that when we did the prayers over the border, the border closed for a couple of months and all the people coming across trickled down to almost nothing? For you notice that? I noticed that. Have you noticed that a lot of our prayers that we prayed, they're happening out there right now? Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that too. The closer to his will you pray, the better results for all involved. Now let's let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm not even sure where I am time-wise, but I am almost done. First Thessalonians 5 and verse 19. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. See, the Spirit has a fire with it. Don't put it out. I'm not going to take the rabbi trail, but too much secular activity in your life will damp down the Spirit's fire. We all have secular activity. We talked about it yesterday. When you got to work, get your work done. But if you get too much secular activity, if that runs on for too many days, you're not back into some godly activity. That fire starts burning. That fire starts burning low. Don't put it out. In 2 Timothy... Paul tells Timothy, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Fan it into flame. Fan it into flame. He's telling Timothy, don't just keep fuel on it. Put some Holy Ghost on there. Fan it into flame. This is why we do the Shemod Leak. The Shemod leak is about fanning that Holy Spirit fire in you into flame. Blazing fire is how we put it in the Shemod leak. Great little prayer. Great little prayer. Now we're going to close out the service and then we're going to uh, have an altar service. It's going to be pretty good. I hope you like it. So if you would uh, stand for the Elenu, we'll do that on the Rev so they can, they can join in. For the Elenu, we open the Torah. 
but we've got the throne chairs in here for Elohim, both father and son, and we're going to bow to there. Though on a normal Sabbath, we would kind of turn to the Torah. Not that we're bowing to the Torah, but that we're honoring God's word. Aleinu la shabayak la adon hakol. La teit gedula la yotzer bereshit. Shilo asanu ke goye ha rezot. Velo samanu kamishkipot ha adama. Shilo sam kelkenu kahem. Vagoralenu ke kol hamonam. Vianaknu korim umishtakavim umodim. Lifne malek malke hamlakim hakodesh baruku. Vene ya mar. Vahaya adonai. Lamelik al koharetz. Bayom hahu. Bayom hahu. Ye ye had on a yehat. Ushamo, Ushamo, Ushamo. Now, this is normally where we acknowledge people whose uh, death anniversary with the Kaddish, but we don't do that on holy days or during Sukkot. Uh, because there's no death and dying during Sukkot. So we're just going to close with the, uh, the Kaddish. Yit Gadal Viet Kadesh Shemay Rabbah. Bayama Divra Kirute Viamlik Malkute. Bakaye Kon Uvyo Me Kon Uvkaye Diko Bayet Yisrael. Bagala Uvisman Kari Viamru Amen. Yehe Shemay Rabbah Mavarak Le'alam Ulame Almaya. Yit Barak Vietabak. Viet Paar Viet Romam Viet Nase. Viet Hadar Viet Ale Viet Halal Shemay De Kudasha Biriku. Le'ala mean Kol Birkata Vashurita. Tushbikata Venekabata. Da Amaran Be Alma Vim Ru Ame. Yehe Shlama Raba Min Shemaya. Vakaim Alenu Vioko Yisrael. Vim Ru Ame. O say Shalom Bim Rama. Hu Ya say Shalom Alenu. Vioko Yisrael. Vim Ru Ame. And then the we bless the people before they leave. Yosef Adonai Alekam Alekam Vial Ben Nekem Brukim Atem La Adonai Osei Shemaim Vaaretz. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord increase you, both you and your children. May you be blessed by the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth. God bless you. We'll be back on Friday night. We have the great eldress Barbara Dickerson is going to be ministering on Friday night. We're going to start the service at 6. Not sure what time we get filming, but it'll be close to 7.15. God bless you and Hoxameach.